Welcome back to Left of Boom. I'm your host, Hope Hodge Sek. I'm joined today by Blake Stilwell, who writes about military culture and veteran employment for military.com. Blake, thanks so much for co-hosting with me today. Happy to be here. This is great. Today's guest is somebody who probably played a role as an advisor or an actor or both in one of your favorite military movies or shows. His film credits include Platoon, Band of Brothers, and Saving Private Ryan, among many others. He's a retired Marine who has dedicated his career to making sure the military and war are portrayed accurately in film. And he's put some of Hollywood's biggest stars through tough boot camps to make that happen. There's a great quote of his about his work that I think sums up the perspective he has really well. He said, people think all I have to do is teach you how to hold a weapon or wear your uniform. Not in my book, not at all. Because a performance comes from the heart and the heart has to have a certain amount of understanding. So Dale Dye, it's a great privilege to have you on the show. Welcome. Well, thanks, Hope and Blake. I appreciate it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm among kindred spirits here. So I'm, I'm glad to do this kind of thing. As we've mentioned, you've sort of made it your mission to help the film industry get it right when it comes to the military. Why is accuracy in portraying the military and warfare so important? And what difference does it make to the American public and their understanding of these topics to have a high level of realism? Well, I, listen, I think there's, I think there's two elements uh, to, your, to your question, Hope. Um, the first element is I think it's important uh, to have a level of accuracy because to ignore that accuracy, to ignore the reality of military service, combat, deployment around the world is disrespectful to the men and women who carry out those deployments, who, who serve in combat, who serve in uniform. Uh, they're some of America's finest. Um, and we should respect them. And part of that respect, in particular, uh, in my view, uh, is to treat them right in the popular media. Now, that's not to say to whitewash things. I mean, hell, we make mistakes. Uh, we screw the pooch every once in a while. But, mm. uh, but I think it's important that we depict them as accurately as we can. That's, that's one element. Uh, the second element is really kind of in Blake's milieu, popular media is pervasive among uh, Americans today. Lord knows how much time they spend, you know, staring at their phones or, or looking at, uh, at, at their computer screens. And so they consume information in huge chunks, in floods, actually, uh, all the time. And where that information relates to our military and the military service I think there's, a, there's an obligation on the part of filmmakers, on the part of media makers, media producers, uh, to try to get it right. Look, half of the time, or in fact, more than half the time, most of the time, uh, the reality of military life, the reality of deployments, the reality of combat is so much more interesting than the crapola that some writer who's never worn the uniform makes up. So uh, in my view, um, we need to take advantage of that social media inroad and use it to show uh, American uh, consumers what who we really are and what we're really about. I'm curious. You said you acknowledge that we don't always get it right. We sometimes screw the pooch. When you're depicting um, the negative aspects of military service on screen, what are what are the hardest parts about getting that right? Well, the, the hardest part um, when, you, when you're doing something um, where the military just has to be depicted uh, in, an, in a negative light, because that's the story, that's what happened, is to make sure that somewhere in there, somewhere in that communication, somewhere in that story, is the reality that it doesn't go unpunished. There, there is justice. If you do something like that, if you, if you make a horrible ass mistake like that, you're going to pay the consequences. Take, for instance, uh, films like uh, Casualties of War. I think that was very important, that the story involved a uh, court-martial for these guys. That's what I'm talking about. There needs to be a balance. Uh, if you're going to tell that bad story, and sometimes you need to tell that bad story, I think it's important to emphasize that people don't get away with that kind of thing. Hmm. You got into filmmaking and advising in 1984, if my research proves right. Back then, what were your biggest complaints about military films in terms of accuracy and authenticity? And do you think that's something filmmakers care more about getting right today? Do you think better work is being done today than when you started? 
Well, I, I hope I hope they do a better job of it today. I think, and and I'll humbly submit that I may have had something to do with that. I think they understand uh, that it's not so easy these days. We are inundated by popular media to suspend disbelief. Uh, you got to pay a little attention to that reality factor, and I think they they do a, a better job of that now. When when I first got into it. I think I was like every other military veteran. You know, I'd, I'd sit in a theater, or I'd, I'd sit in front of my television, and I'd see some military story, and the top of my head would blow off. I mean, they, <laughs> they were making so many stupid mistakes. And I, I said to myself, what the hell is this? You know, I would, I would see credits roll, and, uh, and they would have some guy listed as military technical advisor, uh, some guy or some gal. And I said, well, who are those maggots? I mean, how do they let them get away with this kind of crap? I, I couldn't believe it. And I guess being a Marine, you know, my, my first reaction is, well, I'll fix that. I'll fix bayonets and I'll get out there and I'll attack the first bastard I see that, uh, you know, makes movies and I'll, I'll get him unscrewed. Well, that didn't necessarily work out that way, but I, I stayed with it. Uh, because I, at, even at that point, I felt that my agenda was and, and remains to this day to try to shine some long overdue and, and, uh, and much deserved, richly deserved light on the men and women who wear our military uniform. And I thought that that should be done in the right way, that the problem was convincing filmmakers uh, in a place like Hollywood, which is really a, a small cliquish club, uh, because of all the money that's involved. And if they want all the money and they don't want you to have any, the problem was that they had made zillions of dollars uh, making war films for decades. And now they had this guy coming in who, who wasn't a filmmaker, who was some knuckle dragger, nose picker Marine. And he's going to tell them, <laughs> he's going to tell them, you know, how to, how to do it better. Well, <laughs> that, that went over not real well. And it, it took a break uh, I guess, like many other things in life, you, you got to have that lucky stroke. You got to you got to hit one out of the park. And I was able to hit one out of the park doing it my way in a film called Platoon mm -hmm. uh, with Oliver Stone. We brought that film home from the Philippines and uh, won four Academy Awards, uh, including Best Picture. And uh, and uh, Oliver Stone was kind enough to recognize me publicly for my contribution to that film. And at that point, uh, my point, I think, was made uh, because the phone started ringing off the hook and all those guys who told me I was an idiot, they didn't need me. Now, suddenly they needed me. So the lesson is nothing succeeds like success in Hollywood, I guess. I'm curious. So you mentioned that uh, doing Platoon kind of launched everything. When it comes to films, is being um, more accurate in terms of not just military uniforms, but in everything military, does that really make the films that much better? Has what you've done with uh, movies in Hollywood, has that set a precedent and are movies getting better on the whole? And has that made the whole depiction of the military in movies in general better? Yeah, I, th I think it has, Blake. Uh, I think it has made an impression. I'm seeing a much better treatment. I'm seeing more of a willingness to hire guys and gals uh, to be uh, uh, military advisors on a film. Uh, and I use that word cautiously. There's a technical advisor, and then there's a military advisor, in my view. And the military advisor is much more of a larger part of the whole storytelling effort. I, I see that happening. Now, I, I think I have to throw a caveat in here. Uh, I see that happening among serious filmmakers guys who care uh, about getting it right. There's still the, you know, the, the B-movie, cheapo, trash old guys who, you know, don't care and, and all they care about is how many backflips can you do and how many car wrecks can we afford today? And that kind of thing is, is always going to be, it's a nature of, of the beast and that's always going to be there. But among serious filmmakers, folks who are serious about telling a story visually and, and communicating via film or television, I think, I think I am seeing an improvement. I, I think it's much better, and I'm really glad to see it. When you were talking about seeing movies that were just uh, so bad in this regard, is there one that stands out as a tipping point for you where you're just like, I can't, I can't watch this anymore. I have to go do something about it. 
Yeah, I guess, I guess there was. I was either just out of the Marine Corps or getting ready to get out of the Marine Corps uh, at, at the point when uh, a movie came out called The Boys in Company C. And I, I took a buddy of mine to see it. I think we were in Jacksonville, North Carolina or something. And we went to see it. And I said, well, this, you know, hey, this is, gonna, this is a movie about Vietnam. I know about Vietnam. I, I was there a long time. I, I can dig this. And we went in and I, I absolutely, you know, I puked in my mouth. It was so bad um, and such a, I, I felt insulted by this thing. And I think that was the tipping point. I said, well, I will not tolerate that crap all anymore. I gave these folks 15 bucks to come in and see this nonsense <laughs> and, and I'm through with it. I'm going to do something about it. So if, if I had to, if I had to, put my finger on it. I think the boys in company C tripped the trigger. You know, I interview a lot of uh, veterans who do various things and they all tell me that they had a different experience getting out of the military. And from Vietnam until pre right before 9-11, most people think that they didn't really have a community to go back to. They didn't really feel a part of veteran culture. And, you know, after 9-11, veteran culture has really blossomed and it's really something that people pay more attention to, not just the veteran community, but America in general. So from your time doing platoon and, and you know, all the way to the post 9-11, has it changed how you had to deal with directors or producers? Uh, are people more inclined to uh, hear your point of view or uh, has it changed the way you work at all? Well, it, it's been a progressive thing, uh, Blake. When when I first started in this, uh, look, everybody knows that Hollywood's full of lefties and flaming liberals, and and they have their opinion, and I have to kind of work around it and keep my mouth shut. But early on, there was a negative take on the military. These these guys can't possibly uh, have much intelligence or much creativity, and so we'll just block a story around them, and they'll be the criminals and the culprits, or the dupes, or the stupid guys. And it was it was full of full of stereotypes, and that was, of course, one of the things that I desperately wanted to change. That has morphed. Can I tie it directly to 9/11 and to public attitudes? Uh, I guess. I'm not sure whether I would I would make a direct connection to it. I just think there was a knee jerk after Vietnam, I think. For for a couple of years after Vietnam, there's sort of an attitude developed in America that these guys and gals got a bad rap. You know, they they didn't get welcomed home. They got blamed for a war that, that was unsuccessful and kind of gave America a black eye in the international community. And I suppose there was that that knee jerk helped folks around. I said, well, look, we're not going to let that happen again. You know, the men and women who are, who are going overseas on deployment to uh, the Middle East, uh, they're going to be welcomed home. Not not like we did with the guys that came home from Vietnam. And I think that permeated the showbiz attitudes. I think they said, look, uh, let's uh, let's give them an even break here. And And I was delighted to see that. Uh, I, I'm wandering around here. I, I, I hope that got to your question. I wanted to uh, to ask you kind of a human nature question. By the way, I spent a couple of years in Jacksonville, North Carolina, working as a beat reporter for the, you know, covering Camp Lejeune, and I've seen quite a few bad movies uh, in the Jacksonville theater. You know, I I thought I recognized your name. You used to what was it, <laughs> the Jacksonville what was it Observer or the Jacksonville Daily News? Daily News, yeah, okay. It was a while ago, but. Uh, so, so my human nature question, and this is something that I've been curious about for a long time. So there are definitely movies that sort of play up the nobility and, and heroism aspects of war. And there are others that really emphasize the grit and the misery and the moral gray areas. And I would put Platoon in that category and films like Full Metal Jacket. And yet when I talk to Marines and Army veterans, a lot of them say, you know, I saw that movie and that made me want to join. I think military recruiters have this idea, you have to portray service in this very positive light and anything else is bad PR, but the reality is somewhat different. Films that, that really get gritty and authentic and show sort of the, the brutal aspects of warfare seem to strike a chord and, and draw people towards military service, some people. Why do you think that is? I think there's a relatively simple answer to that, and it, it goes to human nature, human psychology. It has to do with, uh, look, 
I think Ernest Hemingway had it right. War is man's greatest adventure. Hmm. And, and a lot of young men and women are looking for that adventure. And they're not looking for parades and flag waving and that's and bugles blowing in the background. And they know that's nonsense. They know they know from the popular media that that's nonsense. But they're attracted to the the life and death struggle that, that can ensue from military service. That's the adventure. That's the that's the test. Am I a good enough guy? Am I a good enough gal to, to be able to hack it? And I think in their in the back of their perverse little minds, the recruiters know that. Hmm. Yes, they they are they're forced to uh, focus on the the potential for educational benefits and relatively pleasant service and the ability to learn a trade and so on and so forth. But somewhere in there, they know that the real appeal in those BDS little eyeballs that they're looking at across the desk, they know that that guy or gal really wants to test him or herself and wants to to uh, see if they can survive the crucible. And I think that's that's a good thing. I, I've had conversations with my husband and and he feels it more than I do, that desire to kind of prove oneself in the toughest conditions possible. Sure. It's it's part part and parcel of the maturing experience. You get along in school, you get along with your parents, you get along in, in your little society as a young teenager. And eventually you look around, you say, you know, geez, I wonder if I'm good enough to go beyond this. I wonder if I'm good enough to hack it. Now, is that a guy thing? Uh, it, maybe it used to be. Um, but I think, I think females are becoming enormously socialized toward that sort of thing. I talked to some females not long ago. And boy, they, I tell you, tough chicks. They, they were ready to, to get out there and do this thing. But, but what struck me is that they had the same sort of mentality about it, about testing themselves, about putting themselves into a really challenging experience uh, as, as the guys used to. Are you still writing uh, No Better Place to Die or are you still producing it? Yeah, um, no better place to die. Um, one of one of my movies uh, I've written um, is kind of a passion project for me. It's something that I want to do. I mean, we did we did so much for the 101st Airborne Division uh, with Band of Brothers that the 82nd began to beat me up rather strenuously and say, "Come on, you know, where's our 82nd Airborne story?" And the fascinating story to me was was the fight at Lafayette on D-Day and, and for about three days thereafter to hold a vital bridgehead over the murder at River. And so I wrote that and we're struggling to get it done. The dreaded Rona put a crimp in everybody's style. So it, it's kind of sitting on idle right now. It needs to be funded and, and a number of other things. But in the meantime, uh, I'm keeping busy. Uh, I'm writing another Vietnam script right now. And um uh, and I can't tell you too much about this, but there is a there is a trilogy, uh, the third part of a trilogy, Band of Brothers, uh, the Pacific, and a piece about the uh, Eighth Air Force in the in the ETO. And I'm about to go to work on that. That's great. I bring that up because I was you mentioned uh, how young kids are have that challenge mentality. You've gone through it yourself a long time ago, but is making your own film instead of just working on someone else's film? Is that uh, kind of the same challenge mentality? Look, it, it is the ultimate dream of everybody who's involved in, in filmmaking, I think, to make their own film. They, we're, we're all, all of us who are creative types are just full of this stuff. And it's the reason we're in the business. After about 10 or 12 or 15 films and reading hundreds of scripts, you know, I said, listen, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I may not have known it a couple of years ago, but but I'm I'm a visual thinker, and I've always been a storyteller. I don't know whether it's my Irish heritage or what. You know, I'm the guy who can sit you around a campfire and tell you a shaggy dog story and keep you interested for 45 minutes. I'm that guy. I always have been that guy, and I love I love to entertain. I love to to make people smile and make people think and make people ponder a situation that I'm describing. So I think I think it is it is the ultimate goal of everybody who's in the business to somehow tell their own stories or tell stories that they have created. And I'm a little late in the game. 
filmmaking in Hollywood is a young man or young woman's game, believe me. But I'm still, you know, hale and hearty, and I'm I'm still uh, out there banging around. So uh, I'm I'm hoping that that I get at least one or two uh, before I have to quit. That that'll be a film by Dale Dye. What about the Dale Dye story? Is that worth a Hollywood movie? Do you think? It's been pitched to me a couple of times, but I can't think of anybody handsome or intelligent enough to play me. So, uh, so I probably will pass on that. I have, I have written an autobiography um, in two parts, uh, The Art of War, which is about my military experiences and War is Art, which is about my uh, showbiz experiences. When that's gonna be published, I don't know. My wife tells me uh, she's not gonna allow it to be published until I'm dead, which will because it would be worth a lot more money then. <laughs> um, look, I'm, I got to tell you, Blake and Hope, I, I have lived an extraordinary life. It's not over. Uh, at least I don't think it is. But, but I get worried when they keep giving me awards for lifetime achievement. And things. I, <laughs> I keep thinking, wait a minute, it's not over, pal. But um, I guess that I have had more blessings than any individual really uh, should have. Uh, more lucky breaks. Some would say more hard-headedness and tenacity, and I guess that's also true. But but when you're when you're able to um, when you're able to reach audiences in the millions, and you're able to make a contribution to to projects that that affect audiences in the millions, that's that's a great responsibility. But it's also a great joy. It's it's a great blessing. Something that I think probably inspires a lot more people than just me about your story and your career trajectory is the way that you, rather than finding a job, you sort of created one and created a a career field to boot. We have a lot of transitioning veterans who, who read us and come to us for information. What advice would you give to listeners who want to go out and create a job rather than find one and get hired? Do it. Uh, is is my first uh, big piece of advice. Have enough confidence in yourself. Uh, look, if if you're a if you're a veteran, you've been through the training ordeals, you've been through the deployment ordeals, you've been through tough times, and and creating your own job is tough. But you're the you're the kind of man or woman who can do it. Uh, you've proven that. I get 14, 15 letters a week, I guess, or emails. Uh, from young men and women who are coming out of the military and they, I want to be you. I want to do what you do and show this. Look, it, it's not that easy in the first place. Uh, you got to have a broader base of experience than, than four years in the Air Force or four years in the Navy doing one thing, even if you've been doing that one thing at three or four bases. What do you know about the rest of the services? What do you know about military history? What do you know about all these things? Those are the things that are going to keep you at work. Uh, you don't want to be a one-trick pony in this thing. Hell, I've done, uh, you know, I've had to study ancient Greek warfare to do Alexander. I've had to make up warfare uh, to do things like Starship Troopers. So you got to be facile and you've got to be a student of history. And you've got to be uh, the kind of person who, who's willing to put in the work and the labor. You can't you can't just come out to Hollywood and say, look, I was, I was deployed with the... Um, with the 173rd Light Infantry Brigade um, in Vincenza, so I know all about the Army. No, you don't, pal. And you're not necessarily going to be extremely valuable to somebody who's doing a story about the 82nd or somebody who's doing a story about uh, uh, a tank outfit in, in Desert Storm or Desert Shield. So there's more to it than simply saying, you know, I I served four years or I served 20 years Mm -hmm. um, and observe the following things. You also got to be a creative person. You got to be a natural storyteller. Um, You've got to understand the elements of of storytelling, especially visually. And frankly, that's something you've got to learn. You, You can't just bring that. All that said, your background as a combat correspondent, did that provide you with a foundation or support the work that you do now? Or is it mainly things that you had to, to unlearn before you could get started? No, I think, I think my, uh, my experience as a combat correspondent in the Marine Corps was invaluable. I'm a trained observer. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm a storyteller. I get the elements uh, mm-hmm. of style. 
I get I get tempo. I get how how a story needs to be told. What things support the story and what things are extraneous. Uh, what things are erroneous. And and my experience uh, as a writer, as a reporter, taught me a lot of that. So that was a that was a hell of a nice basis uh, to go in. You said you created a military branch when you did Starship Troopers. Are you upset that the Space Force didn't take any of your suggestions? when they created a new branch? I think a lot of people are, to be honest with you. <laughs> yes, I'm right I am. Look, here, here's a story on that, Blake. I, I had always, I loved the book, uh, Robert Heinlein's uh, book, Starship Troopers. It was one of those books that I always carried around in my rucksack, you know, for, for downtime reading. I absolutely loved it, I absorbed it. Uh, it, it fascinated my, uh, my imagination and and when I heard uh, that Paul Verhoeven was going to direct a version of, of Heinlein's book, I jumped through all kinds of flaming hoops to get on that show. I mean, I, I wanted to do this. This was something I, I was really anxious to do. I would have done it for nothing, although I didn't. And I was, I was enormously disappointed, frankly, um, in, in the shortcuts that they took and in Verhoeven's take on the thing, I mean, he Verhoeven, a Dutchman. I mean, he he saw everything as Nazis, and and that was that. And and I thought it was a disservice to Heinlein's story. And I was, I, although the film is a cult favorite. I mean, it's got all kinds of following, and so on and so forth. And I, I'm not ashamed to admit I worked on it, and I and I think I tried my damnedest to to bring something to it, but ultimately the director is is the voice. And, uh, and his voice and his view didn't agree with mine. When you create uh, the culture of a military branch, where did you even start? Where did you think of beginning? Are you talking about Starship Troopers now? Yeah, yeah. When you're, talking, when, when you're creating something like you did with the mobile infantry and uh, the fleet in Starship Troopers, and you're, you're creating a culture, uh, the culture of a military branch, where do you begin? I think the Space Force would probably need some input right now. Well, you, you, you begin with the source material, and, and Heinlein provided a, a bunch of it. But I had to make up a lot of backstory. I had to invent units and invent traditions and invent uh, ceremonies and, and that sort of thing. And that all begins right behind my BDS eyeballs. I mean, that, that begins in my brain. And, and it was great. I mean, I created this 8th Mobile Infantry Division and uh, had some say in the uniforms that they wore, and although not enough say in the uniforms that they wore. And that was fun. I mean, that was that was creating out a whole cloth. So I kind of put myself in the, in the guise of, say, a, a, a regimental commander. And said, "Well, now I'm gonna. This is this is my regiment. And here's what. Here's how I'm gonna create it. And here's what they're gonna look like. And here's what they're gonna say. And here's how they're gonna act. And here's what they're gonna do." And I had a hell of a time with it. I, I invented a whole uh, command and wrote out a training schedule that would that would go to this. And I mean, I was like a kid in a candy shop. I was I was having a great time with it. But it, but it begins it, it begins in the imagination. Uh, I I took. Heinlein's story and extended it into what I thought was probably happening in his head. So do you have some advice for the folks who are trying to create a culture around Space Force in the real world right now? You know, I, I don't know about the Space Force. I'm, I guess I'm happy that we've got one because we sure as hell have space, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure what they're going to do. I mean, I looked it over and, uh, and I said, well, that's cool. So what are you guys going to do? Uh, what makes you different from, you know, the, the come on, you, you've got the Star Trek emblem and everything else. Let's, what, what is it you're going to do? And, and I'm, I'm going to withhold my judgment on the thing and try to keep an open mind until I find out what the hell they are going to do that's different than the Air Force or other aviation branches. I, I get the feeling that I would have been happier if we'd created the Space Force once we were actually up in space. Mm -hmm. and had bases up in there and, and that sort of thing. It, that, that, to me, would have been the great impetus for creating the Space Force. Look, if I was going to offer advice to, to men and women who want to be part of the Space Force, hell, go for it and go for it at an early age because maybe about halfway through your career, you'll actually find yourself up in space doing stuff, which I think would be neat. Mm -hmm. 
the top general of Space Force just the other day said the the PR problem they have right now is that you can't hug a satellite. So it's <laughs> it's not completely yeah. relatable. But I, I wanted to ask you about um, a movie you worked on that is not probably one that you're best known for, but is one that I enjoyed quite a bit. And that's uh, Outbreak, 1995, starring Dustin Hoffman and Morgan Freeman and yourself. You know, as we talk about sort of the futuristic world we're living in, Outbreak is about a pandemic of hemorrhagic fever that's spreading so fast the U.S. military is willing to bomb a U.S. town to contain the threat. So... My first question is, have you gotten any new fans as people rediscover this pandemic classic? Have you? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm in L.A., but I think I, I, my email just lit up. I think every station in, in the United States uh, at some point was running Outbreak. And sure, I mean, people love it. You know, they, they, I got to arrest Donald Sutherland in the film and... and <laughs> So, so you hear about things like that, but I knew it was going to happen. Uh, the minute, the minute this pandemic thing hit and and people started shutting down all over, I said, you know, they're going to be sitting in front of the television, uh, locked down, and and you know that those programmers are going to whip up outbreak and any other pandemic uh, sort of film they can find um, because it's it's uh, you know it capitalizes on the situation that we find ourselves in. So I knew it was going to happen, and it did. And uh, I guess I got a little uh, limelight shit on me from that uh, because I had a nice little piece in it as an actor. Can you share any behind-the-scenes experiences from filming that movie? Something we might not know. Well, look, it's it uh, that was that was a wonderful cast. Morgan Freeman was terrific, and uh, I think that. The, the cast was was superb. I mean, Donald Sutherland and uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman, they they were so good to me as as a, an older guy, but a relatively inexperienced actor. I remember um, there was a we were rehearsing a scene where uh, I play the battalion commander that's got this security cordon up, and uh, I'm in I'm in an office uh, with. Uh, Donald Sutherland, who plays a senior general, and Morgan Freeman, who plays a senior general. And they have, uh, it's discovered that Donald Sutherland has been cheating on this, this whole thing. And, and I'm to arrest him. And Sutherland is to look down his nose at me and say, you're really enjoying this, aren't you? And then I'm supposed to have a line where I, I respond to that. And in rehearsal, Morgan Freeman, who was sitting there, looked at it and he looked at it and he looked at it and he said, Dale, you know what would be better? Don't say anything. Just aim your pistol at him and smile. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's that's taking an, a line away from an actor. That's like opening up your veins. What are you doing here? But he was dead right. Uh, and and we went ahead and ran the scene again. And and I just took the pistol and, and aimed it at Sutherland and smiled at him. Like, you know, payback is a bitch. And uh, and it was just absolutely the right thing. And, uh, you know, Wolfgang Peterson took a look at it and he said, oh, yes, oh, yes, that's perfect. Don't just do that. And so uh, that's the way we did it. But doing the film was full of moments like that. I mean, Dustin Hoffman is one of the I used to call him the little maggot. But he and and Cuba Gooding Jr., who was terrific in that Cuba followed me everywhere, uh, trying to adopt my demeanor, my carriage, my presence. And and he would walk around doing a kind of a bad imitation of Captain Die, you know, and I thought that was fun. But Dustin was a, a great uh, mentor and an acting coach also. Uh, it's it's those kind of guys who who are unselfish who recognize that, that it's all about the mission. You know, it's all about making a great film. Uh, and they're over the ego part of it. You know, they, they just want it to be as good as it can be, and they're willing to help anybody to make it that way. So a great experience. I love that. So much of what you do is based on true stories. It's very on brand for uh, how into realism you are. Uh, is there anything that's happened in the news in the past couple of years that you think might be worth uh, making into a movie? I, I think there's hundreds of things, Blake. Um, you know, you, you focus on, on a single incident, a single thing that's happening. And, and the time for films about uh, our 
God knows, unending wars in the Middle East. I think I think there's probably some stories that are going to leap out of that. I would like to get inside some of the uh, special operations uh, outfits who get deployed well, well under the radar and do some some very interesting things. I, I think there are some stories there, but there's a problem with doing special operations stories. Look, they're sexy and, and everybody loves them. And, and if you're going to sell something to Hollywood, that's probably, you know, you, you got a leg up by doing that. But I, I hate that. The average guy or gal who serves, serves in a line outfit, you know, serves in an outfit that, that is not all sexy and rock and roll and high speed, low drag and so on and so forth. And I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of human stories in there that I would like to get to. I guess you're asking me about specific things and, and I'm not going to tell you that. So uh, I'll, I'll just broad brush it here and say that there's a bunch of stories out there. Well, this has been an absolute delight and I've learned more than I expected to by a long shot. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, I'm absolutely glad I could do it. I love these podcasts. Uh, I, I, love, I love the title, Left of Boom. I mean, Left of Boom indicates something that happens before the action and Right of the Boom is after the action. So uh, I, think, I think you're cutting edge here. I hope so anyway. I, lo- I love to talk to military audiences because I can be me. I can, I can speak the way we speak. And, and to me, that's another aspect of entertaining. So thanks very much, Blake, and Hope, for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us once again here at Left of Boom for this great episode with the legendary Dale Dye. You can find Blake Stillwell on Twitter at Blake Stillwell. That's one L in still, two in well. And I'm on Twitter as well at Hope Sec. If you have feedback on the show or ideas for future topics, send us an email at podcast at military.com. I promise we'll read and respond, and we may even give you a shout out in a future show. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or really anywhere else, please take a moment to rate and review Left of Boom so that new listeners can find us. And as you're waiting for upcoming shows, remember to check out military.com for all the news and information you need about your military community. We'll see you here next time.